Hello, everyone. And a huge thank you to everyone joining us today on this discussion on Does Shifting Security Left Really Work? This is a lead dev webinar created in partnership with ChainGuard. We have about 45 minutes, after which myself and the panelists will go back to the lead dev Slack workspace, where we'll answer additional questions and continue the conversation. You can join us in hashtag effective teams for us to have that conversation. Um, we may also have some time towards the end of the panel to answer any questions that come through the Q&A feature on Zoom. So make sure you use that functionality so that we can interact with you all. So I just want to get started with introductions. My name is Tiffany. I'll be our moderator today. We are joined by some amazing panelists who will be talking about this topic with us. They'll be sharing their experiences and insights. Um, why don't we go around um, the panelists table here? I'll let you all introduce yourselves. We can start with Nsikin. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Nsikin. I'm an engineering manager at Field. Uh, where I lead the development of our energy trading platform for grid scale energy storage systems. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm John Speed. Uh, I am the head of ChainGuard Labs. It's a research lab within ChainGuard, a software supply chain security company that aims to be the safe source for open source. Uh, my background is as a researcher. Um, uh, I currently lead a research team that focuses on open source software security and uh, vulnerabilities in open source software. Uh, I previously worked um, in a research lab associated with the US intelligence community, helping CIA, NSA, and other intelligence agencies manage their dependence on open source software. I'm glad to be here and genuinely interested to hear what the other panelists have to say. So thank you. Hi, my name is Elinor Saita. I lead System Structure Limited, which is a small boutique consultancy. Uh, we do fractional chief security officer services for startups in the immediate pre-A to post-C round uh, kind of phase of their life cycles, roughly in the 15 to 200 engineer range. Hi everyone, my name is Aisha. Um, I'm currently the head of platform security engineering at uh, Densu. I'm leading a team of security engineers. And uh, previously I worked in security governance, security operations, um, as well as cloud security as well. And looking forward to the discussion. Yes, and I think this will be an amazing conversation that we'll have. So thank you for the wonderful introductions. Um, Let's just get started with a few questions then. I'd love to to define for folks on the call um, what shifting security left really means and how have you kind of seen it in your own experiences? So maybe we can start with Antikin. Sure, thanks, Tiffany, great question. Uh, I think from my perspective in organizations that I've worked in and also at field, um, shifting left is about you know, bringing those security considerations sort of much, much earlier in the product design phase. Um, so thinking less about doing it, you know, after you've designed system and, and shipped it out into some production, and then trying to sort of patch on top of that, but thinking about a lot of those concerns in the early stage of the process and designing security in from the jump. I think the other part of the the process around um, shift left for me is very much in terms of making sure that you have an actually collaborative relationship between your security teams and your dev teams, that they are very much like actually part of the security process because you can like you can shift the responsibility left and then still have it just be security throwing stuff over the wall at devs and devs, you know, like, you know, you, it's about kind of making this actually not a merge team, there's still separation of responsibilities and understanding, but like actually making it more of a collaboration. And I would say that this actually goes almost even more so to product owners and sometimes the design team even, um, like product design, product management, that kind of thing. Um, project management as well, but also the actual product, product team. Yeah, I'll just mention that there are sometimes 
um, a couple definitions that I find simple, straightforward definitions, easier to latch on to, but not necessarily with the spirit of what Eleanor and NC can mentioned. One is that I think there's a technical perspective that says um, shifting left simply means adding lots of tools that check properties of your code, security, or linting or other things in your CI pipeline. And I actually do think that those things are helpful. Uh, I'm not discouraging those. Uh, ChainGuard, uh, you, we use Go code. We use all sorts of Go linters. Um, um, but I think I think there can be problems with that. Though I'll leave that for later. And I think there's another thing that is only it's a a accidentally malicious implementation of shifting left, and that is it's simply giving, like Eleanor mentioned, lots of responsibility to those frontline devs building that last piece of the app and saying you're actually responsible for the whole app. Um, and um, I think that's uh, unfair, and I'm not saying uh, that's done intentionally, but um, there's a hope that, well, since that dev building that last piece of it uh, knows the most in some sense, uh, well, give them the responsibility because they have the most relevant contextual knowledge. And I worry that they're, that's actually unfair. Um, and I think um, wise engineering leaders know this, um, but I worry it can happen accidentally. I think that shifting left is like security itself is, is a journey of balancing dev empowerment where dev takes on security responsibilities as well as security expertise and SMEs holding that safety net. And that's where the balance between embedding security into dev, sec dev seeing security as, as you know one of their responsibilities, as well as ensuring that those CI checks are available and security um, experts are there for guidance all the way from design to you know uh, higher level environment uh, production releases. Um, it's, it's sort of that balance also because of the distribution of org and how, and how it works. In organizations, you may have solution architects working on the design and you'll have engineers working on the um, platform where the application will be hosted and the app will be worked by special dev teams. And, and you know, to be able to shift left with all of them will require that orchestration. So I think it's, it's that balancing act. I love all of the perspective from this panel. It's really amazing to hear uh, that that kind of perspective in it because I know that there can be a lot of challenges whenever there is any change or any need for um, additional requirements. So I'd love to hear more about some of the challenges of shifting left and what are some practical ways that but what are some practical solutions or methods that you've seen work really well for organizations? And maybe we can uh, uh, start with Eleanor since you were talking about product teams. Yeah. So I think the biggest, the single biggest challenge that I've seen at all of the clients who I've worked with has been uh, actually getting the team enough time, you know, because this means that now okay, we've got a roadmap and you've got deadlines and you've got, you know, all of the team's time is actually is allocated. And I see at a lot of startups, they basically run the team at 100% allocation, right? And if you then drop a bunch of bugs in their lap, they're not getting done, right? Uh, and the, the worst version of this that I've seen is, hey, you've got a bunch of KPIs for specific features getting completed or improving specific metrics and you've got individual and team bonuses tied to those KPIs, oh yeah, and also do security, but there's no cap yeah. And then everyone is shocked when absolutely nothing happens. Um, so I think, you know, making sure that you're incentivizing the thing that you think you want to have happen, you're being honest with yourself about what you're incentivizing and how you're incentivizing it, and making sure that the team actually has the resources to do the work is, like, that's kind of the baseline, right? If you haven't done that, nothing else is gonna matter. And among other things, this also means you really have to have actual exec buy-in, not just the CTO, but also COO, CFO, et cetera. Because like, if you're, if you're doing a serious initiative and if your code base is like at any scale of maturity, et cetera, like this is actually going to shift how you spend money for real. And if the execs aren't on board with that, fine, they'll do it for the first quarter. And then they see, hey, wait, and then now you, yeah. So uh, I think those are the two biggest things is basically resourcing and intent. If you've got that, 
and you've got a you don't already have a toxic relationship between security and the rest of the company, which um, it's the my luck to be generally the first person in at a lot of startups. So I, I get to hopefully set a good relationship. Uh, but yeah, if you if you're if you're not in that position, and you've got the resources. Great. You know. Yeah, and I see and see can, um you'd like to add something as well. Yeah, no, definitely just wanted to add into what Eleanor mentioned. And I think I think part of that challenge with the sort of buy-in um, and getting the whole organizational machine on board with the direction of doing this um, is also sort of quantifying sort of what security left means at sort of any any phase within your within your development life cycle. So, you know, if you're the kind of organization that's working to OKRs, what will your security OKR be, right? And I think um, just like we think about technical debt, although I'm not sort of bounding security with technical debt, I think if, if we're not able to sort of quantify the value add or the, or the business risk in terms of exposure from the business, I think it can be quite difficult to, to get that buying from stakeholders, um, and particularly where we have stakeholders that are not necessarily close to the detail, for them to sort of see what benefit is this, is this driving from business particularly if there's a trade-off to be made, right? So, you know, to pick some of the examples that Henry mentioned, um, if you've got super hot feature you need to ship before X time and it's a resource contention problem between this and your security, you know, OKR um, or objective, I think you need to be able to make that business case quite clear uh, to the team. Um, and I think even in cases, you know, I think almost going with that objective of um, when must we have rectified a certain thing by, right? Because, you know, with all these things, it's risks. And so you need to be able to manage that well or at least present that for your stakeholders to make some informed decision about how you choose to handle that. I mentioned that one way that these the definitions I mentioned earlier show up as concrete problems is that if if one takes the naive definition that it's simply adding lots of checks and those, those checks passing in a CI, then it can actually create a very um, slow or non-existent inner loop for the developers associated with that. Um, you know, a developer, the best case is that their day-to-day -day feels like actually their freshman year of college or university um, doing programming challenges. You know, small changes lead to improvements and you can then do, run it again and everything passes. But unfortunately, um, there are certain security properties you might want of your software that you're, once again, that dev working at the top can't easily do, they might not have the permission or knowledge, and I'll be concrete. There are often vulnerabilities in operating system packages in your virtual machines or containers, and that is not something that a small code fix uh, can simply change, um, at least most days, most organizations. Um, these Those operating system packages come from Linux distributions that then themselves have release cycles, and it could a uh, vulnerability could hang out there for months or even longer, and saying to the dev that, all those operating system vulnerabilities need to be gone, needs to be at zero, or you can't pass, um, is simply creating an infinitely long loop for them. Uh, it really just doesn't make sense. Um, I'll say another challenge that shows up that's related to is that if you think that shifting left simply means the dev team needs to take on the security re responsibilities since they're the, in the position to know, you can simply have role overload. You know, you looked at all the things that a developer is expected to know and do in their formal description. And if it's going pages, you have role overload. And uh, it's just, it's hard because it requires them to shift to do so many different things in, in a given day or week. Um, and it's also tough to hire. It means that now you've created um, very difficult requirements to find um, a particular person appropriate. So those are some concrete, more minor, I think, manifestations than the broader ones that Eleanor and Seekan and others have mentioned. Yeah, and I I love the fact that you brought those up because I know that there can be some challenges when it comes to like redefining what those roles and responsibilities are for everybody across the organization. And I know that Aisha, you might have um, had something to share around that as well. Mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to cultural shift. Um, um, because it, it is definitely a behavior change that we're looking at here. So whether it's in the role description or the, the fine, it's, it's as rigid as that or not. It is the day-to-day -day behavior of a developer that will make the difference uh, if we're looking at, you know, completely to the left. 
Um, so in order to uh, in order to target this in in the most a uh, practical way we need to understand how uh, our dev teams work and this can really differ organization to organization size to size industry how regulated you are sometimes you will want to accept those vulnerabilities because they're not reachable they're not exploitable so we'll need to make sure that we uh, we arm our, our developers with the right not only uh, guidance that that cultural shift as well as the tool that that will support them um, unfortunately, there's no one recipe that can be handed out to everyone that can just like, be implemented. It will definitely require some groundwork and understanding of what the, where the gaps are and what, what our objectives are as security to achieve uh, that in the first place. Yeah, there's definitely a big, big um, a cultural shift when it comes to you know, learned behavior of if the dev thinks security is a separate entity that will tell me when I'm doing wrong. Um, and that that behavior will definitely go against what we're trying to achieve with shift left. Yes, and I I really love that what you said about um, uh, about this not being a one size fits all solution for folks. Right when we c come in, we're thinking about you know how do we shift security left. So I'd love. To this is the perfect segue, by the way. I'd love to shift over to my next question, um, which is like, and and we can start with John Speed. You can um, kind of share more a little bit about this, and I'd love to hear everybody else's opinions on this too. But what are some strategies or technologies for shifting security left that you've seen work really well? Yeah, I'll just mention this is more of a philosophical approach. I think there's there's one idea that there's a lot of uh, security issues out there that uh, are probably in a backlog, and you should simply create a very efficient and effective way to triage them. Uh, some sort of spreadsheet or spreadsheet plus plus that lists them all out, and you really know which ones are the more important ones and which ones aren't. And um, unfortunately, I think that that is inevitably, at least to some degree, going to be a approach. But there's another approach, um, uh, and I'll, I'll mention by this by way of a failure, a personal failure of mine and others. Um, a, I, I won't mention to you, but another person uh, who is very interested in open source software and software development practices. And I, he and I wrote an article that we called Shifting Up. Um, and uh, the joke is that if you really think that most of uh, open source software, or most of your software decisions actually these days start with third party components and services, that you should be really thinking about those too, in addition to all these CI checks and other things about your own code. Um, we said that the Harvard Business Review uh, got rejected. Uh, still sitting on a Google Doc somewhere. But the, the point is that uh, uh, we were arguing that consumers of open source software and open source software packages should be extremely picky, and they should have the right to be picky. Um, because if most of your software is actually coming from organizations other than yourselves in terms of lines of code or functions, uh, you should care about those functions. And you should um, not simply accept it as something that some dev yesterday, some decision they made, but as something that you today can care about um, and uh, be picky about. So for instance, um, uh, what you can do is you can uh, look for sources of software, look for components, services, third party things that you trust. Um, and that's because they fix CVEs fast when you need them fixed. Um, it's because uh, you trust their build processes, uh, you trust their security processes, uh, you think they have rigorous testing, and so they don't just ship something that gets out the door but meets standards that you and your teams can rely on. Um, so in some ways, it's about radically future-proofing uh, the software that you're building on. Um, and so you could call it shifting up, um, but that will never catch on. Shifting left is too strong. but. Um, and like I said, it was rejected. So uh, I'll just mention that. One of the things which I've seen as kind of a frequent stumbling block is companies that don't understand how they make architectural decisions. Um, because like once you're within this, once you're dealing with code that's within the scope of a given team, like, yes, you've got dependency issues and other stuff, and it may be that like, oh, wow, we did this everywhere. Okay, that's going to take six months to fix. You get those kinds of things. But a lot of the time, and as I see this especially because I'm mostly working with startups and often quite high growth ones, 
I had a, a customer last year double their entire team in a year. Um, and when you're looking at that kind of growth, uh, you don't actually build out the patterns that you would normally want of like, oh, okay, we've got 120 developers. Okay, we've got some kind of architectural council, review board, whatever, so that like, hey, I'm making a change that's going to affect multiple components. Let's sit down and talk about it. Um, and that also, um, like I've served on a few of those those groups in various contexts, and that also ends up being a useful, I, I don't want to say choke point, but kind of point of contact where you can start injecting security concerns. Um, in general, I think for the only other places we see equivalent things are around performance. And because performance is customer impacting, this often like gets a lot more attention. But because security is a joined up property, right? It has to, the entire technical stack and the entire operation stack has to be, you know, at least has to be kind of part of the solution. It often really challenges companies that haven't dealt with those kinds of whole system properties that much before. And that's one of the reasons why I mentioned like an architecture, um, not function, but like collaborative, like some kind of process, because often that's one of the places where you start at least getting the, the, um, the vision to see the whole joined up system. Yeah, I was, I was just going to chip in on that point as well. I think um, particularly for young organizations, you know, field where I work is, is quite a young organization, I think having that architecture design review process, you start to see sort of the common problems you tend to solve. Uh, and that forms that point for thinking, okay, how do we make like a consolidated approach to solving this? Um, and I think, you know, most often when you, when you have that collaborative conversation about the design, I think you can start to design out some of those security risks that you could expose yourself to. And then when you do go through those uh, periods of rapid onboarding, if that's the sort of organizational or business context you operate in, there is at least something for folks to start with. That's a better, you know, more improved security posture than what you could have had if, you know, 120 folks are organically solving a similar kind of problem in a slightly different way. Um, so I just want to echo that's a really good point on architectural design review. Yeah, I I really like the the additional insights into that. Oh, sorry, Aisha. Yeah, sure. Um... I was going to add to this, this uh, architecture reviews, architecture forums that you could look at, you know, as a strategy with an organization, really get close to your architects as well as the uh, product teams. And sometimes what I've seen in, in, in my experience as well, it helps security to put on different hats, like performance is one, observability is another, cost is another, modernization of the application is another. So I believe that there are many things that security can bring that will not only improve security, but get everyone thinking security is the most of the time part of the, this unit that sits in the organization that can have that big picture as opposed to the others just worrying about, you know, their part of the story. Um, and that really helped uh, me in the past. So one of the strategies could be think beyond um, in trying to bring in other aspects like the ones I've listed, that will also benefit security as a consequence and as a result. Yeah, I I definitely kind of generally try to drive that way. Anytime that you can show that, oh, we did all the security work, but actually we've now solved a bunch of other problems for the company, people become more willing to listen to you. Next time you say, hey, we're gonna need to do a bunch more work. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, um, to just uh, mention real quick something that Sikin said about figuring out the approach to solve a thing. Um, one of the things that I often, or that can be a little bit of a trap with SaaS tools is, okay, great, you've got a developer, developer has a bug, developer fixes the bug, off you go. But that's generally an instance of a bug, right? And you may have that instance in a bunch of other places. Maybe you're only, maybe you're not dealing with the backlog. You're only fixing stuff as you, you know, on new check-ins. Um, you know, if you've touched the file, then you you own the file. Okay, fine. But um, that means that you don't really have this, the point where you would say, actually, no, we want a class fix. We're going to pop this out to the framework level. Okay, this is a much bigger project, but then we get it fixed properly in one place. 
And I think that that's uh, the kind of piecemeal thing and like who has what scope where is one of the things. And I mean, if you get to that point, like where you're where you're solving this, like you're doing pretty well, but it is still a bit of a trap. And thank you for that wonderful call out. I just want to remind everybody here that it, that is joining us live. If you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A feature on Zoom um, to enter any of your questions, and we'll make sure to take them at the end or even in the Effective Teams Slack channel. I think that this everything that the panelists over here added was really helpful and a also great follow-up to uh, my next question, which is, let's say you are part of the architecture review board or you know, you're, you're someone who's a key stakeholder in driving um, some of the security initiatives. How do you measure success when shifting left? What are some KPIs and metrics that are you know, good symptoms of things that are progressing nicely and, and towards you know, what, what the end outcomes are? And maybe Aisha, we can start with you. Yeah, um, I think that like we discussed, there is the people element, there is the processes element, and there is the obviously the toolage element. And traditionally, if we were to think of metrics um, and KPIs, we could look at if you have a tool in, embedded in, in your CRCD pipeline or the SDLC uh, uh, within the life cycle, and that will identify the vulnerabilities. Traditionally, what you'd look at like mean time to remediation, the number of vulnerabilities for application, et cetera, et cetera. I think sometimes it, uh, it can be very easy to fall into uh, um, the idea of seeing these metrics as, you know, showing the real true picture as uh, it's they're very, very much contextual. So there needs to be always in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, I've, and I've met people who think differently in the industry as well, uh, there should be qualitative description that comes with every quantitative uh, number that you, you see. Uh, and numbers can easily you know, pick, p paint a picture in the way that you want to explain. You can uh, sort of sh showcase it that way. However, like we were discussing and, and John Speed mentioned earlier with, you know, uh, third party libraries and, you know, uh, may perhaps uh, open source based images that you use, et cetera, that would, you know, natively introduce vulnerabilities to your environment. So one way of looking at it is how embedded are you within, for example, your application development that is containerized and you are working with developers and ensuring there's this minimal base image that's being used, for example. Um, or that we are looking after our dependencies and there are some security updates that can be enabled as, as quickly as possible. So some of these numbers will definitely help along with toolage that can be implemented. It's, it's very important to bear in mind that you can update a version. That doesn't necessarily mean you're getting rid of vulnerabilities. Sometimes you may introduce new vulnerabilities. At the end of the day, they are not your code. So how do we establish a system that this information will then further inform other security controls and measures that will manage the risk overall is how I would describe um, how to look at, you know, uh, reporting and metrics from shifting left, left perspective. Even the number of developers that come and reach out to you or your team you know, throughout their day to day, that could be indicative of some of the culture change as well. So it's important to look out, you know, think outside the box in this. Yes, and I saw a bunch yeah. of panelists nodding their heads. Um, I'm a I'm a big outspoken proponent of qualitative metrics uh, in general. And one of the things I actually often really discourage firms from doing is like, don't measure things that you can't, that aren't real, right? Don't make up data, don't make up numbers. Like, okay, you've got a thing that you can measure. Does it actually correspond to anything that you care about? Um, there was a, um, I can't remember quite who said this, but there was a, uh, a friend from the security industry a few years ago who proposed some like measure actual real things that you care about. Like how many lines of non-memory safe code are executed each second outside of a sandbox, right? That's a thing which you can actually instrument your build environment and actually get real data from 
and you want to drive that number to zero. Like, great, that's a, you know, so this is now something that you've got that's actually meaningful. Um, and in general, I would, I would argue that if you're, if you're under a thousand engineers, honestly, most of the metrics that you have around rarer activities like security bug fixes, you don't actually have enough instances to start having meaningful data. You're just dealing with a sequence of edge cases. Um, and I think that recognizing that and then figuring out, okay, if we don't have metrics, what does a qualitative approach look like, right? How do we engage maybe a, a bit more thickly with developers so that they can start like passing up, you know, some of that kind of code smell sort of thing, that, that kind of thing. And, it, and it's, it's more work, right? It's more work and it gives you a product that you're gonna have to think a bit more about in a decision-making context. But what you get out of that is actually useful and you're not just kind of telling yourself a story about how the world works. I'll mention one thing that I heard earlier that I really like is that it's um, trying to build the case for security improvements using traditional engineering uh, measures of productivity, uh, quantitative or qualitative. Um, and I, I think this is a powerful way to think for um, security audiences. Uh, obviously, time to fix CVs and other things like that is important. There's, there can be valid uses of metrics like that. But um, if you take... Um, you know, engineering leaders often care about engineer productivity. Um, and uh, going back to the individual developer's perspective, you want some measure of their inner loop. Um, that's not necessarily something you can measure through studying their commits necessarily, uh, but it is something you can gather through asking your developers how fast they get things done. Um, you can even uh, actually ask people to, to more senior engineers to work with them and see how fast their inner loop is. Other things that gather that sort of a thick understanding of a developer's inner loop. Um, so um, I think a lot of uh, shifting left is actually supposed to avoid the security interrupts that you come if you treat security and development as, as linear. Um, if uh, the developers don't like to hand off a piece of software for their months later only be told there are problems and have to do rework, they too consider that uh, frustrating and ineffective, just like the security teams do. So. Um, you know, having these measures of engineering productivity, and they're often, it's not easy to measure through simple technical artifacts, um, I think is a very valuable um, perspective to bring um, and can often in, actually involve talking to or surveying and doing other things. Of the developers. Yeah, uh, really, really great point that I wanted to jump on there, John Speed. I think um, one of the sort of class of metrics you could also think about are, are the lagging ones. Um, generally, they're not preferable, right? Because the feedback loop is, is, is slow. And usually by the time, you know, the horse is sort of bolted. So, so you do have that catch up right? Um, but I think they can also be effective for trying to quantify actually like has X or Y or Z improved. So, you know, things like architectural reviews, depending on the size of your organization, you might have, you know, the team and the skill set to sort of do this internally. Um, or you might have to hire externally and you know, have some folks do the spot check on, on your architecture. Um, and any sort of review like that will drive, you know, will identify issues um, with some appropriate risk weighting. And so I think, you know, it could be the sort of thing where you make it a semi-periodic, uh, definition of semi-periodic may vary, but as a good way of checking, okay, we have some of these leading metrics, um, but actually what's this other lagging metric that, you know, is a bit more subjective, um, can, can provide, you know, a bit more of a nuanced view on actually this is the purpose of my platform or software application. Uh, and these are the sort of functional vulnerabilities it has. Um, that can be quite a useful way of measuring how your shifting life is going over time. Love that. So let's say that someone is starting from ground zero, completely new and they're looking to shift security left and leave a positive impact in general, what what should they do or keep in mind? Where should they start? Who should they involve? Let's start with Nsikin and go around. Yeah, sure. So really great question. I think um, definitely starting from from zero, I think, you know, Greenfield can, can often be this, this huge dream. I think Greenfield also has like a great level of responsibility that, that comes with it. And I think, you know, some of the things to think about 
are actually have have the stakeholders in my organization got a good picture of how important important this is for us. Um, I think part of it is also thinking about um, like what's your organizational context, like what's the general risk profile that's acceptable within your context, and then making sure the right stakeholders are, are pulled in. So, uh, in the case of field, for example, we operate in the energy in the energy storage space. So, you know, our risk profile is we're connected to um, utility equipment that's providing electricity to grids. So we need to think about, you know, our physical operations teams that are looking after these energy sites. Um, and so when, you know, if, if there is a vulnerability, say, in, in terms of uh, data can go to and from a physical site, then, you know, the operations team needs to understand, actually, this has impacts for, for how this site might perform and it might give more energy than we expected it to or less or things like that. And so, so I think it's trying to identify those key stakeholders uh, that are relevant for your, for your organization's risk profile. Um, and I think from that stage, I think part of it is also making sure they're bought in, but making sure that they remain interested in this topic. Um, because I think what you want to avoid is almost a sort of helicopter management style where the stakeholder sort of dives in, here's there lots of problems, and that seems to be the only message that they are hearing. Uh, but I think being able to communicate that sort of, you know, steady cadence of, of work uh, being done to address these risks as they come up, I think that can be a really good way to involve your stakeholder network. Being a trusted guide, I really love that. I'll mention that uh, an unfortunate reality that just got alluded to is most code, most of the time, if it's successful, hangs around for a long time. Um, actually, the more successful the code, the longer it's going to hang around. <laughs> so um, uh, you might say, oh, well, that's, that's frustrating uh, because it is nice to start new projects. Uh, it's fun. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, it removes constraints and considerations that you will always have. But it's just not reality for successful software projects most of the time. Um, and uh, so it does It does actually create a special burden for someone starting a new project. Um, and what I mean by that is that uh, if you really expect your project to be successful, you want to take steps now, things like architectural review boards, but, um, but other things too, that try to, try to future-proof against all the woes and ills that are going to befall your software project in the long term. And so I think that means that if you're at the, if you're a two-person startup just doing your thing, uh, ignore everything I'm about to say. Um, but if you have a more mature software development practice and uh, you, know, you have customers and revenue and regulations and compliance, um, then what I'm about to say I think applies. And that is, uh, you, uh, like mentioned, you want something like an architectural review board. And second, I think you um, want to make choices about the software that goes in, everything below that top um, that your devs think about. You want everything below, whether it's the third party APIs you're hitting, dependencies, or something else. Um, you want to make smart decisions about uh, what can go in there. And you should be entitled to be very picky about uh, what you choose and the security properties and who it comes from and their processes. Um, and you don't have to just rely on some random container registry somewhere. Uh, to be make your devs happy. So, um, so there's a lot there. I realize, but I'll turn it over to Eleanor. Yeah, I I definitely like to second some of that. Um, like if you're starting an actually new code base, for the love of God, just no memory unsafe languages. There's no longer a justification to do this. You know, it's 2024. We knew this was a problem 20 years ago. Um, but the the thing I actually want to talk about um, is product and. Because one of the things, there's sort of two kinds of security vulnerabilities that we deal with, right? There's code level vulnerabilities, buffer overflow, et cetera, that kind of thing. But there's also like who's targeting you and why, right? And some of this is just going to be, well, you're on the internet, right? So therefore you get targeted, right? But you can also make choices with the way you design the product and the business that may make you more or less susceptible to these kinds of security risks, right? You can choose whether or not you're building a, pro building a product that's going to enable fraud, right? Um, like if you're if you're running some kind of marketplace, right, you're going to end up with a fraud team and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so maybe don't unless you need to. Right. And, uh, and it, it sounds facetious, but like a lot of the time 
partially security should be a voice in some of those business decisions, but also I've seen companies make relatively small steps in existing products, which suddenly radically changed the sort of business risk level security footprint of the product. And that's one of the reasons, you know, and it's, um, I mean, I've, I've had the experience of, of doing a security review with, a, with an org that had spent 18 months on a product. And then the outcome of the security review six months before launch was they killed the entire product. And that was 150 people for 18 months. That sucked, right? You never want to end up in that position. Um, and so there is a further left that it makes sense when you have a more mature, again, this is not, I would say this is a two person company problem, but for like half an hour once. But then as you become mature and you start making, you know, business model changes and that sort of thing more often, um, it is something where it also makes sense to have someone in security who has the time to actually listen to these people and understand their worldview um, and the bandwidth to, to kind of have those conversations. And those are really great points. And I also know that we are almost at, up at time. So maybe we can go round table for all the amazing panelists to share one final piece of advice for the audience to take away for this session. Uh, we can start with Aisha. Yeah, I would say that if you would like to shift left or go into that journey, understand where you are, what your needs are, what your risk level is, get get to know the program, get to know the, the teams and the org and get really, really close to them and make their problems your problem. And then your problems will become their problem in future, being security. And then um, definitely establishing uh, relationships and communication is the very first key to this. And then uh, the rest comes. I guess I'd say one of the things which really helps is that security can meaningfully give back, you know, so that they're not only just the people who show up with problems. And that can be like, uh, I worked at Etsy for a while and security were the only people in the building who had candy. You know, there were plenty of healthy snacks. If you wanted candy, you came to security. And it's silly, but it actually, you know, it was like, that doesn't work if you otherwise aren't doing the work, but if you are doing the work, it's sort of a, a token gesture that really, you know, like, you know, but also in bigger ways, also in bigger ways. Ideally, security can be not just a one-way street. Yeah, I'll just mention that. I think a, a winning move, though it's, it can be hard, is to show that better security actually increases engineering productivity because there are fewer interrupts, because there are fewer failed product launches. Um, it's, a, it's a tough perspective. It's not a day-to-day -day perspective. It's a long, long-run perspective. But... Um, I think that is a way to convince um, the engineers who sometimes feel like they're shackled with responsibilities they don't want that actually it's in their best interest in the long term. Wow, lots of great pieces there. I think the, the final one I'd add is, is you know, really having a solid um, architectural design review process and, and the sort of team to support that, uh, whether an internal security team or or someone with the designated responsibility, you know, whenever that council convenes, I think it's like the sort of icing on the cake, if you will. And a wonderful cake it is. So I just want to thank all of our wonderful panelists today for sharing all of their insights and experiences. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, we... <laughs> in this group, we'll be heading over to the lead dev Slack channel effective teams now. So you all can continue the conversation there. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. We hope to see you next time.